Welcome, everybody. My name is Mark Johnson. I'm from a professor in the art department and also the university's gallery director. And we're here, thanks to Susan Shimanoff again for organizing today's program as part of a bigger collaborative effort. So I just sort of want to ground us in the bigger collaborative <laughs> effort first. Uh, there's an exhibition of the gallery uh, called The Illuminated Library that borrows from the J. Paul Leonard Library, as well as the Sutro Library, which is on the fifth and sixth floors. If you've never been up there, they've got a lot of treasures also. And we're working in partnership with the Merced Library, and Jasmine's here from that library, and the Palo Alto Art Center, uh, which has a related exhibition. So there's all of these entities exploring art and books right now at the fall in the Bay Area. And I have to say our biggest inspiration for this was the reopening of this library as an intellectual center, not only for San Francisco State University, but really the Bay Area more generally. Uh, and one of the things that we think about when we're doing stuff like this is of course uh, literature <coughs> for different age groups. Uh, I will mention that uh, last Sunday we performed in the gallery a Gregorian ship that was about 600 years old that's in the collection here. Uh, and at the same time, there were a lot of children in the gallery that could have cared less about <laughs> And they gravitated for the children's books. And I was just joking that one of the children's books that we have on display in the gallery, I sort of dove to the parent and said, I don't know if that one is appropriate to read to your child right now. Because it's a story where the two protagonists both die. And it's kind of a heavy picture book story. Check it out if you're curious. <laughs> <laughs> and for us, I think the most exciting part of any project is uh, to work in collaboration with so many people. And so as I look around the room, I see Chernoff from Creative Writing, whose work is on display in the gallery. We're so happy to work with her. Darlene Tom is from the library here, has been such a big part of many of our art efforts over the years. And I particularly want to recognize also David Funk, who is here, who just graduated, so he is no longer a student. Now he's on the other side. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> and at the conclusion of the program, I do want to invite everybody to visit the fourth floor, where there are cases that have been created as exhibitions. Uh, some of them are about children's books, but about other things as well. Uh, so please join the exhibition after this is over on the fourth floor. I'll be up there just to visit with everybody. Uh, and to begin the introductions today, we are very honored to have our head librarian, <laughs> Debbie Masters. So uh, please welcome. Thank you, Mark. So I don't have a big role today. I just want to welcome you warmly to the library and to the events room, and I hope you'll be back to all of the spaces in the building many, many times. We do have two collections of children's books on the fourth floor. There's the circulating collection of children's books that has been developed in large part through the efforts of Jeff Rosen, who's one of my colleagues sitting there. And there's an historic collection of children's books called the Archer Collection that's part of our special collections. I invite you to explore both of those. But I learned in talking with Jeff and also with Meredith Eliason, who's the one who knows the most about the Archer Collection, that Susan has been very instrumental in our shaping the circulating children's book collection to reflect LGBT themes and to bring in not just the high profile titles, but titles that deal with gender roles, with gender identification in children and adolescents, with parents, relatives, and friends of parents who are gay, bisexual, transgender, books that recognize and acknowledge the feelings that children have about these issues, and has resulted in a really distinguished collection that has those kinds of themes represented, but also other kinds of themes that deal with difficult issues for children, like death of a pet, a parent, a sibling, 
terminal illnesses, HIV experiences, a family member being incarcerated. It's just kind of broadened out to multicultural themes, social justice themes, diversity themes, and I think Susan was a real catalyst for that development, and we thank you for that. And David Funk, who's been mentioned, has two books in the display from the Archer Collection, When Megan Went Away and The Harvey Milk Story, the first of which was a gift from one of our library faculty members, who's now emeritus, emerita, and Meredith would say it's one of the pioneering works for LGBTQ literature for children. And the second one, the Fine Arts Gallery has obtained a copy inscribed by the author that they'll gift to Archer so that the copy we have can go into circulation. So there's just wonderful, wonderful representation of themes and issues that I think you're here to explore. And I just wanted to offer you one other thing, which is the American Library Association does a list of the top 10 challenge books every year. And from 2006 to 2010, there's a book that was number one in terms of being challenged. In 2009, it was number two. In 2012, it was number five. And it's a children's book. Do you know what it is? <laughs> No? Good guess, though. And Tango Makes Three. Illustrated story of two penguins. Follows their six years true story. When they formed a couple, were given an egg to raise, and it was challenged for homosexuality, unsuited for the age group, religious viewpoint, other issues, anti-ethnic, anti-family. You name it, it was challenged for it. So go read it. Thank you, Mark and Debbie, and we want to thank all of our sponsors for this panel, and especially you for coming to share your afternoon with us. We appreciate the opportunity to share a few ideas with you, and after all the panelists have spoken, we hope to have a few moments for question, and we will go up to the display and hope you'll join us, and we'll also be willing to answer your questions then. I hope that you've had the good fortune, I hope every one of you, to know the experience of sharing a picture book with a child as they delight in having their own experiences illuminated and new experiences illuminated for them. However, it is adults that have control over what children have access to. And some adults have very strong opinions about what children should be able to see. Picture books with lesbian and gay males have been among the most challenged books, picture books for children, the most challenged books in the United States. Adults who make these books available to children advocate for the millions of children who themselves identify as LGBTQ or their family members, and they also advocate for the millions more who will interact with their families. People who oppose these books do not want these lives illuminated. But those of us on this panel have and will continue to illuminate these lives. Marcus Eward, author of 10,000 Dresses, will be sharing his perspective with us as an author of the book. Mike Dutton, illustrator for Donovan's Big Day, will be sharing with us his experience as an illustrator. Loretta Torres, who is a fifth grade teacher and not here yet because she's still teaching young people, <laughs> but will be here before three and we'll welcome her then, uh, wrote with other co-authors a teacher's guide to the book Antonio's Card and she will provide us examples of how you might use these books as an educator. Amy Kilgard, director of Dragons and Dresses and Ducklings, oh my, 
will present to us some examples from the performance that she directed of eight picture books with LGBTQ characters. I'm Susan Shimanoff, and I'm going to share with you some of the research that I've done looking at 185 picture books with LGBTQ characters starting from 1971 when the first was published to 2011. Now I promise you I'm not going to talk about 185 books or 40 years of uh, children's <laughs> literature. But I am going to take that research to put the seven books I'm going to talk about in context. And so I wanted to let you know about that. In terms of our panel, I'm going to be the first speaker and the rest of the speakers will proceed in the order in which I introduced them. When I talk about the books, I've chosen two topics to share with you today. You've already got a little preview from Debbie Masterson, Banned Books. Last week was the annual uh, Banned Books Week, so it's not too far away and it seemed appropriate that I share some of those with you. And then I'd like to share with you what I think is a positive trend in some of the more recent publications, which is a more positive communal support for lesbian and gay males in the children's literature. Now I suppose it's appropriate that I warn you that I'm going to be showing you images from censored <laughs> books, but I'm hoping that most of you are brave enough or curious enough to remain anyway. Daddy's Roommate. Daddy's Roommate was number two from the decade of 1990 to 1999 as the most challenged book. That's two out of 100. It was right behind scary stories. <laughs> Adults who tried to keep this book from children did so by officially trying to get it removed from libraries. That didn't work, stealing it, or if they were a little more moral, hiding it, putting it in an adult section only, threatening library funding, threatening educators and librarians. They took a very serious attack of trying to keep this book out of the hands of children. So let's see what this book has. Yes? Is the, ch is the challenge process all those things that you just said when, when you say a book is challenged? Yes, it could be any of those things. Okay. Yeah, thank you. The book is told from the story of Nick, the young gentleman that you see on the floor here. And Nick tells us that Daddy and Frank live together. They work together, which is how this was described. They eat together sleep together, shave together, the three of them do grocery shopping together, barring some cereals are not okay, right? Uh, they go to ball games together and they sing together. And a whole lot of more togetherness throughout the book in the text and in the illustrations. And Nick's relationship to Frank is much like what you will see in other books about step parents, very similar to what you'd see in heterosexual books on step parenting. Nick's mom is very supportive of dad and Frank's relationship. She's supportive in the text, she's supportive in the pictures, she's supportive in this book, and she's supportive in the sequel, Daddy's Wedding. When Nick asks her, what does gay mean? She says, it's just one more kind of love. What I think is remarkable about this, it has to be put in the context of the 185 books that I reviewed. In looking at those, less than half of them had allies for lesbians and gay males in the books. So having Nick's mother as an ally, I think, is a remarkable quality of this book. Another remarkable quality is the way in which affection is expressed in this book. I think it's remarkable because it's mostly absent from the 185 books. Most of them don't show any touching between intimate partners, and when, it, when they do show it, it's very little, like a little tap on the shoulder, maybe an arm around a little bit, but not much. <laughs> Daddy's roommate has more touching than the average. It only has four pages with touching out of 27, so you might not think that's much, but it is remarkable compared to many of the other books we have. Frank putting his arms around Daddy, Frank consoling Daddy when they're making up from a fight, putting on suntan lotion, and sitting close while watching TV. 
None of this touching is referenced in the text, but having it in the illustration, I think illuminates the statement that's in the book that gay is one more kind of love. Heather Has Two Mommies is probably the best known of all of the books. And it too faced much of the same censorship that was faced by Daddy's roommates. And so Allison Press, the publisher, decided that it would offer to libraries who had purchased copies of Heather's, Heather Hess's Two Mommies, a replacement copy if someone had walked off with their copy. And as soon as that offer went out, more than 500 calls came in with libraries saying, we need a replacement copy. What you see here is the 10th anniversary edition, not the first edition. A first edition is very difficult to find. Our library owns a 10th edition, not the first edition. In the 10th edition and the 20th anniversary edition, you will read that the book was changed from the first to the subsequent editions. We, the, the change was described as shortening the book, and it did indeed shorten the book. And it also addressed a criticism that had been levied with regard to talking about Heather's conception. That's been removed from the subsequent editions. But as a researcher, I wanted to know what was the context and what all of the things that might have been removed from that book. And our librarians are fabulous. They got me an original copy to look at. <laughs> Not to keep, but to look at. Yes. When was the first edition published? In 1989. And thank you for your question. I'm going to ask you if you'll write your questions down so that we can get through all of the presenters. So anyway, when I looked at it, what I found was there are eight pages missing from the original edition to subsequent editions. And I'm not going to have time to show you all of them, uh, but I'm glad to show them in my office if you want to see them again. But I, what I want to do is summarize them for you. So what's gone from the later editions? Gone is a declaration of love between Mama Jane and Mama Kate. Gone is the reference to their kissing. Gone is the illustrated hugging. Gone is any partner touching. Not just gone from these eight pages, but nowhere else in the books. In my opinion, the absence of these things that have been removed have significantly diminished what is being illuminated. You heard about this book, and Tango Makes Three. This is a more recent book, nonetheless controversial. You heard all the ways and times that it, too, has been banned. This is a story about two real penguins who lived, loved, and parented in Central Park Zoo in New York. But there are adults who do not want children to know about this true story. So this must be a really scary book. It looks like it right from the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look. The author tells us that Roy and Silo bowed to each other, walked together, they sang to each other, and they swam together. This let their caregiver, Mr. Gamze, decide that they must be in love. Roy and Silo built a nest, found a rock which they thought looked like the eggs that other um, penguins were sitting on, and they sat and sat and sat on it, and guess what? Nothing happened. <laughs> but Mr. Gamze had access to a fertile egg that was not being attended to, and he gave it to Roy and Silo. And they sat and sat and sat on that until their daughter was hatched. And when she was, Mr. Gamze decided to call her Tango because it takes two to tango. And when she was hatched, then Roy and Silo did all the things that other penguin parents do. They taught her how to sing to them, how to eat from them, how to swim, all the other things that the other penguins were doing. They were good parents. Now, and then these pictures you see are ones that we probably should banish, right? It's, they're scary. Um, as I read the books, evaluate them, and think about the comments that are made, I ask why 
ban these books. And as I look at what the comments are made about the books, the only thing that I can conclude is those who oppose them do not want us to illuminate the lives that are represented in these books. The books make truth the following, make the following truth transparent, that some males love other males and raise healthy and productive offspring, and some females do the same with other females. When Skoll and Kaufman did a research study with fourth and fifth graders and shared with them picture books with lesbian and gay males in them, the children's response was, why haven't we been told the truth before? The truth needs to be told. The lives of LGTB persons need to be illuminated. The 85 books that I reviewed presented these lives in a positive way, but they also presented them as somewhat isolated. This is a picture from And Tango Makes Three, and I invite you to look at the illustrations. I think you'll find this family is often separated from other families in the penguin enclosure. They're set aside. It makes it easier for you to find them. But I also think it communicates a particular kind of relationship in that community. And it's one that is replicated over and over again in many, if not most, of the books. Daddy and Frank have no friends except for Nick's mother. Kate and Jane have no friends at all in their book. And that's true in many others. But I'm seeing a change, and I think this change is important. The research shows us that in the bullying research, that children who identify as LGBTQ or whose family members do are significantly bullied more than other children. But the research also shows us that friends are really important in this process, that friends can help interrupt and stop the bullying, and they can be a resource if it begins. So I think it's important that we're seeing in some of these textbooks this greater change towards communal support. One such book is The Dear Child. There is nothing in this book that would lead you to think in terms of the text that it is about lesbian or gay males. What it's about is a letter from parents to a child about the unsurpassed joy of being a parent. Everything's more wonderful. Why, the sky and the clouds and the moon and the stars and the birds and the flowers, everything is more beautiful because you, dear child, have arrived. The illustrator chose to represent these three families in the following ways a single white male, a multiracial lesbian couple, and a heterosexual couple of color. What's also remarkable about this book is that these families show up repeatedly on the pages of the illustrations. One family is foregrounded and the other families are in the background. Now the scanner that I had access to didn't give me the full two-page scan, so you're gonna miss some of it as I show you, but I encourage you anyway to get the original, set a child in your lap, and look for the families that are there and the relationships that they share. They go lots of places together. For example, they go to the beach together, the snow, they camp together, they play at a pumpkin patch, and at a park, and lots of other places. They also show up at each other's celebration. So they are present at a baby shower, at a birthday party. These illustrations and combinations illuminate that these are friends. They are playful. They are likable. They share more similarities than differences. And they are like so many other families. The illustrator's choices have enriched our understanding of family and community. In our mother's house, this lesbian household is very popular in their multicultural neighborhood. Again, more popular than I'm going to be able to show you because it goes way across the pages of this book. Again, put it in your lap with a child. The multicultural neighborhood helps them build a treehouse. 
And on either side of the tree house in the, in the book itself, you'll see more members of the community working together to build this tree house and enjoying a meal together. Lots of people come to their house for lots of different holidays. This shows you one at their dinner table, and what you can't see is another whole group that's sitting on their steps listening to a story. Lots of people come to celebrate with this family. Each year they offer a block party where they have lots of different activities and food, and here you can see just a few of them, cotton candy, sushi, soul, and in these examples of activities and food, we get this sense and of the people of the great multicultural group enjoying and celebrating with this family. Here's a wider view and get a sense of how big this block party is. There is in this story also a sexually prejudiced neighbor, but it is this neighbor, not the lesbian mothers, who are isolated, out of touch, and out of favor. The neighbors are shocked at her behavior. The book One, Two, Three, a family counting book, has no words in the text of it that would lead you to recognize lesbian or gay males in this book, but the illustrations invite you to multiple interpretations. Let's take a look at the first page. One family going for a ride. Is this a family of one mother and two children, two mothers and a child, or what configuration do you see? And does your image change when you notice the bumper of the car that is going away, which reads, hate is not a family value? Page two, two houses with families inside. And on the lawn, a sign that reads, welcome home, daddies, in the plural. A male in the front holds a sign, it's a girl and a, it looks like boy. And what you don't see is in the upper right on the other page are three males, they look like adult males to me, looking down at that sign. Are these the new daddies waiting for news of their child? or are the new daddies in the house next door? The readers get to allow to use their own experience, the words, the illustrations, to make their own illuminations. Later in the book, from the number 12, 12 friends swimming in a pool, and 12 parents watching, trying to stay cool. The use of space and touch and eye contact allow and invite an interpretation of lesbian and gay male pairings. And so it goes throughout the book up to number 20. The Harvey Milk Story. I've included this book here because out of the 185 books, it is the only, and I repeat only, biography for children under the age of 12 written in English that makes explicit reference to a lesbian or gay male relationship. We need more books like this. Marcus and Mike and all the other illustrators and authors, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> Time will not permit me to show you much of this book, but I have selected a few of the illustrations. One of the things it does is illuminate different emotional experiences. Here's one of many where you see Harvey likes people, they like him. His charisma comes through throughout the book in many of the illustrations. But we also see his anguish as he feels the need to hide his gay identity. As the book progresses, we see more and more lesbian and gay male couples, as we do here on the steps of City Hall, and that's in part because of Harvey's political activities. But I also think as the book progresses, it helps us to see and mirror a greater openness and acceptance that Harvey was trying hard to work towards. The last page, the last one I'm showing you is actually from the first page on the cover, where we also have a marcher from the Gay Freedom Parade of 1978 with a sign, End Hate Now. We can contribute to this worthy goal by sharing books like the ones that I've just shared with you and the panelist is going to share with you, which illuminate and celebrate LGBTQ individuals and families. 
My thanks to all who have already done that work, including our panelists, and I'm eager to hear more, and we will hear next from Marcus. Thank you. Everybody. Okay, hi. Hi. Um, okay, so my name is Marcus. Uh, I wrote oops, sorry, this book, 10,000 Dresses, which came out in um, coming up on five years ago, 2008, uh, published by a press called Seven Stories Press in New York City. Um, let's see. Uh, thank you, Susan, for putting this together. Um, so I've, I've been a writer all my life. Um, I, uh, all my first boyfriends were writers, um, some pretty significant LGBT writers. Um, and uh, I did not start out in kids' books, but I was such a huge reader as a kid myself, and... Um, I always knew I wanted to write kids' books because no matter how much a book touches me nowadays, nothing, nothing, nothing can compare to the impact a book had on me when I was a kid. And I think that's, I think that's true for, for most people. Um, I also, nowadays I'm, I'm a nanny. I have a little nephew who's now two and a half, and I've been his nanny for the last two years. And... Um, it's been really fun to read with him, and it, it really um, it reconfirms for me what I was what I th what I thought I knew about kids in books, which is kids of a especially of a, a young enough age, they just throw their whole being into the book. They have no um, they may be a shy kid, but their entire engagement is in the book. They they don't. You know, we as adults know how to be bored and we know how to tune things out and, and stuff. Um, but a kid at, at a young age does not know how to do that. So they're, they're bringing their whole being into the book. And um, as a writer, why would you not want that? You know, you know sometimes uh, when I talk to people about writing kids' books, they're like, oh, that's cute. You know, it's like, well, you're nowhere do you touch the whole being of a person as you do with a kid's book. So I've always been super interested in kids' books. Um, I always knew I wanted to write some. Um, uh, let's see. The, the impetus for this particular book, I've been, I've been writing a couple other books and sending them out to different publishers, um, including the people who uh, published uh, Donovan's Big Day, but they turned me down. Uh, I got turned down a lot. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I went to the, um, the, the big LGBT film festival, you know, that's here every year in the city, and I was watching a lot of, um, a lot of the movies on folks who are intersexed, where it's uh, people who have genitalia that's, that's, that kind of doesn't um, line up exactly with what we tend to think of. Like, this makes you male and this makes you female, there's ambiguity there. Um, so I was watching those ones and also a lot of the transgender things. I myself am not transgender. I'm cisgender, which is the, the flip side of the opposite of transgender. However, um, a lot of my own gender identity development, I've, I've uh, well, the first person I ever came out to was RuPaul. So that, <laughs> that gives you, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and he was just like some local little performer. I mean, this is a long time ago. And uh, I wrote him a coming out letter, and uh, we were friends then for a couple of years. I was like 14, 15. So anyway, I've had, and then since moving in the city, I've lived here since 93, and I've been very involved in the, you know, kind of queer um, uh, communities. Um, so a lot of dear friends have been gender fluid, trans, and, and it's actually really helped me, 
I, I had a real conflicted uh, identity growing up as, as male. That was a really, that was not a fun fit for me in a lot of ways. And it wasn't until I saw butch lesbians, uh, many of whom then later transitioned and are now, and now um, are, their gender identity is male, um, that I really kind of saw some kinds of masculinity that I, that I liked. So that's, that's sort of my background. So anyway, um, so I was, watching, I was watching these films in the Gay Film Festival and there was this one thing about uh, intersex people and some friends of mine were in the film um, uh, talking about their experiences and what happens to you or, or what used to happen, it's happening a little bit less, is if you have ambiguous genitals, you will be surgically operated on and like a lot and very invasive and some of these people um, were operated on so heavily that they now can't, they basically have no feeling in their genitals. And this is solely because people were so, uh, f doctors and parents were so freaked out. You shouldn't have these, you know, and this is something that occurs naturally. I don't know what the instances are. Anyway, so it was really sad and this one person, like I said, that I kind of knew from the community was up talking and I, I don't know how this person identifies gender-wise, but they were saying, um, I just dream of the day that one day little intersex kids can run around and they haven't been they haven't been interfered with you know they haven't they haven't had these like really invasive surgeries, and the person was choking up as they were talking. I was like, oh god, I gotta I gotta I gotta write about gender stuff. Um, and another uh, film that I saw maybe that same afternoon was um, there was uh, 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 it was three girls and their uncle was in the process of transitioning to female gender identity. And, um, and the youngest girl had absolutely no problem with it. She's like, fine, I get somebody to paint my toenails with, awesome. <laughs> and then like, th progressively older kids were progressively more uh, uncomfortable with their, with their uncle, now their aunt's transition, um, because they had received that much more acc acculturation. So I was also really m moved by that. So I knew I wanted to write a, a, a book about gender with a transgender um, theme. And I also knew that that had not been done in kids' books as of yet. And there are books, uh, there are books about gender identity. Um, when I was growing up, there was, um, uh, what's it, William's Doll, A Doll for William? Um, William's Doll, and there's another one called Oliver Buttons is a Sissy. Um, but there was no book, so there were books about people doing things that were gender atypical, a girl who's a tomboy, or a boy who likes dolls. But there was no book where a child is saying, no, 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 y I am not this gender that you think that I am. And um, I'm not gonna go into the whole kind of uh, sociology of this, but there really are kids who, that's almost the first thing out of their mouth, you know. You're a girl, no, no, I'm a boy. Like right away, no, no one in their environment is telling them this, no one is, I mean this is solely self-directed. Um, so, how much, how much time do I have? Uh, you can have the last 10 minutes. Okay, great, okay, so, um, so I sat down to write a book, and it was gonna be a book about um, uh, some kids, it was gonna be from the perspective of a girl watching her uncle transition, change gender identity. And so I started writing it, and it was all like, oh, uncle picks me up from school and carpool, and I'm playing on the playground, and here's my sack line. And I was just like putting myself to sleep, I was so bored <laughs> with this book. It was so social realist in this way, uh, if I were going to talk about LGBT books, too, there's, there's, I think because authors who've wanted to write LGBT books um, for kids, there's such a social mission, and so often the books are very social realist in this kind of, to me, kind of heavy way of like, here's the suburban car, and here's the packed lunch, and here's the cubbies, and here's the... And when I was a kid, I really wanted fantasy. I wanted magic, I wanted fantasy, I wanted all that. So no, no disrespect to those other books without whom I would not be here. 
But I knew for me, I was, well, for one, I just knew I was boring myself to pieces. I could not write this story. I was so bored. And the girl was going to have, it was just like this after school special. The girl was like, like, oh, my uncle. Nah, nah, nah. And, and I just didn't believe any of it. Like, I didn't give a shit about these characters, and I didn't believe in them. And I was like, oh, God. And so I, I was like, OK, dude, you can write anything you want. You're writing this book. You have total creative control. What do you really want to write about? Like, what really seizes your heart and your interests? And um, I was like, oh, well, what if it was like dresses, but they were like made out of magical things, like gold or like windows or, or flowers? Or um, And I was like, OK, there. That's it. That's the book. And that, that gave me the structure. Again, the book's called 10,000 Dresses. So it's about a child named Bailey. Uh, I'll get into that in a sec. Um, and um, every night, Bailey has these dreams of these different dresses, these kind of magical or, or fantastical dresses. And she goes to the people in her life and asks, you know, can you help me get a dress? And they're like, you shouldn't be thinking about your dresses. You're a boy. Um, one thing I'll tell you is that I, throughout the book, I only use uh, she and her and girl to refer to Bailey. Some of the characters will say, Bailey, you're a boy. And, and it's amazing how just that one little pronoun switch, I mean, that's all I did is, is, is I always refer to Bailey as she because that's how Bailey, the character, would identify. And, and people like cannot, I read so many book reviews and they're like, this is about a boy who wants to wear dresses. And, and the gender pronoun changes every line. It, it's always something different, and it doesn't. It's only ever she for Bailey, but it's, it's like it's so, I mean, that's like l the most radical thing <laughs> that I did. Um, it's not that radical. Um, let's see, what else do I want to tell you guys? Oh, and, and it was also very important to me, too. So I was very happy when I came up with this magical dresses. One, because like I said, the, my heart was now engaged in this book. And, and it was this longing that this character had for these beautiful dresses. Now, obviously, gender is more than just the clothes that people wear, but it gave me an inroad into talking about Bailey's gender. And, um, and also, it was very important to me, too, that another problem that you see, and this isn't just for LGBT books, but like books about kids um, uh, with the multicultural multicultural backgrounds or divorce or whatever. They're these very single issue books and they can be really heavy handed. Um, actually, a few years ago when I was coming to visit your class and this one woman in the class said, uh, yeah, they're like social policy books. And that just doesn't make for a good kid's book. And I really wanted this to actually work as a kid's book, whether you gave a crap or not about the, the message. I really wanted it to be evocative and be magical and be enchanting. Um, and, and I just think that does, you know, because as LGBT people, that's not just the one thing that we are. We have all the things that we love. So equally, this book is about somebody who's an artist uh, who, who has these visions, these, these dreams and these things that she wants to create. And people also don't want to hear people don't want to hear it because of the gender component, but also no one is sharing her artistic vision until at the end she meets somebody and then they're making dresses together. Um, so I think it's it's super important to just to always address people in the in the round. And what I love, and I'll talk a little bit about the artist. Um, what I love what the artist did. So the artist is a friend of mine, Rex Ray. Um, he he is a he lives locally, but he's an international artist. Um, uh, he's very cool, um, and I just gave him the text, and he basically did his own thing with it. And I love this radiant burst around Bailey um, because uh, yeah, it Bailey's center stage. It's her story, and that's the other thing too. I didn't want this book to be. Um, I forgot where I was going with that, sorry. <laughs> um, so let's see, so I wanted to tell you a few things about the artwork. So one thing, had I given Rex more direction, he, he didn't want any direction, he just wanted to go up and do his thing. 
I was going to actually ask for Bailey to have more ambiguously length hair so that when you open the book, you're thinking, oh, you know, Bailey basically reads as a boy in this picture, I think, for most people. And I'm actually glad that he went the way that he did because to me that actually underscores the message of, okay, wait, we're reading this kid as a boy probably just because it's got sh the child has short hair and the little undies and stuff, but the text always says she, she, she. So I thought that was actually really cool that Rex did that. I'm glad he, he did that. And then a couple other things too that I think he did really well. So here's Bailey in her first, uh, one of her first dream dresses. It's made out of crystals. And then um, Bailey goes and talks to her mom. And you don't see the parents. You never see the parents. Um, and you just see this like disapproving back. Um, and that, that's repeated a couple times when Bailey goes and talks to her dad and her brother and stuff. You, you do not see any, anybody else's face, just Bailey's. And again, I thought that was a really, that was really brilliant until, so here's Bailey confronting her brother. That doesn't go well. Um, there, little tiny Bailey, big disapproving legs of mean brother. Um, until, okay, great, thanks. Bailey finds a friend, a neighbor girl, and this is the first time you see somebody else's face in the book, and I thought that was brilliant, and I didn't, I didn't even get that consciously until I read a book review uh, where somebody was explaining that, or, or maybe it was you, or I can't, I can't remember. Somebody pointed that out to me, that yeah, no one gets to have a face until they are an ally, and I thought that was kind of beautiful. Um, I've been banned in Texas. I think it's like one school in Texas banned us. Um, uh, actually, though, we have not. We've kind of flown under the radar. Every once in a while, some right-wing groups um, do these videos. And again, they always talk about it in terms of cross-dressing and like, oh, it's teaching your boys how to wear dresses and all this stuff. Um, Whereas I think the, uh, the message that I think would be even more threatening to them of, no, this is saying that your child gets to choose what identity, what gender they are. Um, that goes unremarked, um, or I just think they're not even noticing it. Um, that said, the book um, came out kind of right at the time where anti-bullying became such a big deal, so I can't actually complain in terms of how the book's done out in the world, and also the American Library Association, which was referenced earlier, they, they championed this book very early on, which was great, because you want the libraries on your side. Um, and then just one other thing I'll say uh, in my last few minutes, and thanks everybody for, for being here, um, is um, uh, I read this at, a, I, I've, I've only read this a couple times to actual kids, and uh, I went to this one school here in the city, and I read it to the kids, and um, this one little kid raised his hand, and he's like, do you live in San Francisco? I'm like, yeah. He's like, do you live across the street? I'm like, no. Do you live, do you live like over there across the street? No. Um, no one's, at, basically no one's asking me about the gender of Bailey. That's not the issue. Where do I live? Um, and then, and then the same, I think it was the same old boy. He was adorable. He, um, we were, they were all, all the kids were lined up. There was like 40 kids. And by the way, they were all dressed in dresses. They all showed up in these like sarongs and serapes and stuff that they had made and these head dresses and stuff, all the boys and girls. It was really sweet. Um, and then this boy, basically, because since I'd written this book, clearly I've written every book that's ever existed. So he's pulling every book off the library shelf, like, you know, Goodnight Moon and Caps for Sale, like any kid's book. He's like, did you write this one? No. Did you write this one? No. Did you write this one? Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much.
Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Dutton. I am an illustrator. Uh, let's see if I can get this full screen. Uh, no. Sorry. Technical difficulties. Uh, yeah, so first I want to thank Susan for inviting me. Um, really honored to be here, uh, very excited, a little bit nervous. I um, have had very little human contact in the past two months uh, due to this thing, and so I could either not know what I'm talking about for the next 20 minutes, or I can maybe over talk. So, uh, but I promise, hopefully, it, it's gonna, it'll go somewhere. Uh, but <laughs> we'll get somewhere. Um, but yeah, a little bit about myself, uh, I'm an illustrator. Um, the uh, book, Donovan's uh, Big Day, uh, was published by 10 Speed Press, uh, which is, it was actually Tricycle Press, which was the kids division of uh, 10 Speed Press, uh, a subsidiary of Random House. Um, I've since learned, unfortunately, that 10 Speed is, or Tricycle is no longer around. Um, but I had the great uh, honor and pleasure of this being my first uh, children's book. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about um, my sort of uh, journey, getting getting to where I am, uh, how I got uh, how I got into illustration. Um, much like uh, Marcus uh, said in his presentation, uh, from a very early age he was uh, writing. It was just something that he was drawn to, and and for me that was drawing. Um, here I am with my my two brothers. Um, this was in Korea. I'm the uh, one on the far right. Um, the oldest of three, uh, three boys, and uh, we grew up in the army, uh, so we moved around a lot, and um, because of that, we had to make friends um, from scratch uh, quite often. So this left us with a lot of time to kind of play with each other, and one of the things that we did to, to kill the time was to make drawings and, and play games based on these drawings. Uh, so that's something that um, has, has stuck with me for, you know, uh, apparently uh, my whole life. And I don't know if you can see the drawing. It's a little, it's a bad scan, but um, from an early age, I um, had this interest not just in drawing, but, um, but in making comics and trying to be funny. And this was my idea of a one panel gag, um, <laughs> not knowing anything about uh, work, but uh, it seems to actually be kind of appropriate and accurate of my current, my current uh, state today. Um, but uh, I, from an early age, there was this very um, there was this there was this element of art that that I was drawn to, which is the sort of marrying of of pictures and words, um, and how they sort of play off each other. What can what can uh, words uh, what what can words say and what can pictures say and and how they and there's sort of a language uh, um, a unique language for both. Um, Moving forward, I um, became more interested in in um, children's books, and uh, it was actually a very uh, a very strong sort of moment of clarity that I had um, uh, as to why I wanted to get into into kids publishing. Um, and I've been sort of doing a little bit of everything, and Marcus kind of you actually alluded to fantasy art, and that's actually where I got my start. I was doing uh, uh, freelance work for companies like Dungeons and Dragons and, and stuff like that and I got tired of drawing figures with 17 belt buckles and <laughs> just didn't make sense and I wanted to do something with a little more substance and uh, after a while I uh, um, it wasn't until I uh, had gone on a trip to Europe and discovered all these other artists that I realized that this was my calling uh, but the the moment of clarity was actually um, was actually one winter uh, I was uh, in a in the uh, children's book section of Barnes and Noble and it was a, during a particularly difficult time that I was having with my dad. Um, uh, and uh, the, this book was by Perilous, book, or Perilous Buck, and I think it was called Christmas Morning. Um, and uh, I just remember the book is, just to kind of take you through that really quickly, um, it's about this boy who knows his father works very hard and, um, and gets up. Uh, they live on a farm, and his dad gets up at 4 in the morning every day to 
to um, take care of the farm and, and be a responsible, uh, hardworking dad. And so his son on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, I can't remember, decides that he's going to step, uh, step in and give dad the morning off. And he goes in and he wakes up at four in the morning and, and he, you know, milks the cows and does all of that. And, and uh, I was sitting there and just, you know, thinking about my situation with my dad and, and how I wanted to, to be that, that person that could step up. But it was uh, um, sort of a, it was such a difficult time uh, for me as well. And I just started bawling in the middle of the children's book section in, in Barnes and Noble. And, and um, luckily my wife was there and she, you know, kind of shielded me from the other kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but that, that was a very decisive moment for me that I knew that I, 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 I had always known that children's books carry, um, s- you know, there's a potential there to, to really uh, carry a strong message. And this was to me, um, that it, it, for me it felt like uh, children's books was, for, m- for me anyway, th- um, um, the best way to communicate, you know, a message without, without being, you know, heavy handed or, or, you know, hitting somebody over the head with it. Um, so uh, in my own illustrations, you know, like you can see from here, it's, it's very, uh, it's based on a lot of observation. It's about um, being, sort of immersing yourself uh, in your surroundings and making informed uh, decisions on, on what you draw. And I think, you know, there's a place for magical uh, unicorns and rainbows and, and even 17 belt buckles. But um, for me, um, powerful art is um, made um, when it's sort of based on, on uh, you being able to stand behind the artwork. And so here you have, um, with the far left, it's uh, based on this concrete slide in Berkeley. Um, you can actually bring your own cardboard, or there's usually cardboard lying around. You can actually go down this winding slide. Um, the top right is based on just painting trips. I like to go out and, and just sort of paint on location. Uh, the windmill there is from Solvang. And uh, I was there on a painting trip and sitting out on the sidewalk with a headlamp so that I could see my paint. Uh, and then the bottom is just from a day at the beach um, with my family. But uh, sometimes I'm st- I still like to uh, find a way for words and pictures to play off each other. And uh, much to the chagrin of my coworkers, um, because I tend to make puns in meetings and it makes people unhappy but I thought I'd share them with you anyway. (laughs) So that kind of brings me to what I do now. Um, I'm actually uh, one of the doodlers, uh, we call them. Uh, I work for Google as a full-time illustrator. Uh, And we uh, we illustrate these things that you guys may see on the homepage. I don't know if you guys use Google or heard of it. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I've been there for three years. um, And and trust me, this is, this is going to lead into Donovan beautifully, I, I think. Um, <laughs> but um, what it's about is, is, again, it's about context. It's about creating a picture where in a very, very brief moment, you know, people are on their way to the homepage to do a search. Uh, this is something that kind of it's, it sidetracks them very momentarily. Uh, sometimes it takes them down a rabbit hole of searches. And that, that's, for me, a good thing. It means that I've done something that compel somebody to kind of stop and pause and, and sort of take in this other thing, um, uh, even briefly, uh, or to say, you know, that's nice, and then move on. But if, the, if it compels you to be, uh, to sort of dive into this person's life, you know, for celebrating a famous poet or, or artist or a writer, um, then I feel like I've done a, uh, then I feel like I've done my job. Um, that leads me to another thing that, we've, that we do at Google. Uh, we have this event called Best, um, uh, doodle for Google, where we invite children to um, submit what their best day ever is. Uh, that was a theme of this year's contest, and we had a lot of things. You know, people for the beach was really popular. Uh, that was kind of like a lot of kids' best day ever. Um, another one uh, was uh, the day that a, a kid got to become a bigger uh, brother uh, when his when his sister was born. That was like the best day ever. And the winner was actually um, a girl whose f- um, whose best day ever was when her dad had just come, uh, got, when her dad had just returned from being stationed in Afghanistan, and she did this progression where um, she meets her father after a while of not seeing him, and then, um, and then it had this embrace. So again, there's this, um, there was this opportunity to, to, to really um, use art in a very, um, in a very compelling way 
uh, with the minimal use of words. So that finally brings me to the book that I illustrated, Donovan's Big Day. Um, this actually is something that I did um, several years ago. It was um, uh, actually I got the email from Tensby Press in 2009, the same week actually that Google contacted me, and it was this perfect storm of uh, <laughs> uh, doing art tests for both companies and um, and somehow being able to land this book. Um, but maybe I'd talk a little bit about the process of of what the art test involved. Um, so so Joanne, who was the editor there, um, wanted me to draw what I thought Donovan might look like. And I thought, you know, kind of in just where I was artistically, I wanted to do something sort of um, playful and very childlike. And so I did this where D Donovan is obviously a lot more cartoonish and proportions are really uh, kind of all over the place. And um, Joanne actually had this bit of feedback where she really wanted Donovan to look um, more realistic. And she based that feedback on something I did um, several years ago uh, where this girl is just sort of staring wistfully out the window while she's doing laundry. And, um, and, and so what it, th her rationale, which I, you know, I, I thought was a little bit, I didn't agree with that first, but I'm, I, th I'm definitely glad that I came around, was that the message in the story uh, should di dictate the design. And in this case, we really wanted sh uh, a story that um, that would be that would be very human. And I think doing something very playful and cartoonish m just it might kind of cheapen that message. Uh, and I think it works and it has its place in other in other mediums. But for this for this particular book, um, we um, she really wanted it, uh, to feel like this was a significant day for a very small boy. Um, let's let's really draw him in a way that. Uh, we can explore the full range of emotions, and so uh, you know, I thought, well, that's going to be a lot, a lot more work for me, but um, I, I went with it, and uh, we came up with uh, this design here. Um, the drawing on the left is the one that she actually saw and said, "That's that's Donovan," and um, kind of going back to what I was saying about your illustrations being informed by your experiences. I, I have to admit, I don't have very much experience with uh, gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender themes. And in fact, I knew when I first got this book that it was, uh, it, was a b it was going to be a bit challenging because I, not having that experience, was afraid that I would create something that wasn't authentic. Um, and one of my other guiding principles when I'm working on illustration is to, to always illustrate for one person. Um, have somebody in mind that you're, you're sort of devoting this piece to. Um, that makes the piece feel more authentic. And as long as I did that, I knew that I would have something that felt authentic even though, even if my own experience was limited. Uh, and I did that by basing the character on my own sort of, um, my own upbringing and, and sort of channeling my own unique experiences into the character. Uh, and in this case, it was me growing up in a biracial family. Uh, my mom is Korean. and. And uh, you know, I, I grew up and was teased a little bit when I was living in Korea for for uh, one uh, not being full Korean, two for having the name Michael. So they would call me Michael Jackson, and they kind of kind of laugh. And so ha so channeling a little bit of that experience into this character sort of helped me feel that I was creating something that would feel authentic. And then uh, this is just very briefly another test they wanted to see where uh, I drew the actual moms. Uh, so we can see on the left that um, that the mom is possibly bi biracial, um, and that would be the biological mother of Donovan. And then the one on the right, she said um, she wanted it to kind of channel a little bit more of Leslie Newman, the author, um, a little bit of her personality, a little bit of her spunk and kind of crazy hair um, here tamed in this case. Uh, and actually, I apologize for the bad quality of the image. That was actually... I think I shot it on a cell phone uh, while I was in vacation in Greece and, and uh, had to send that over to the editor and, and s while I was abroad, s you know, kind of continued to be unsure if I had the book or not. They said yes. Um, this is a pretty bad, pretty bad um, slide. It's really kind of blown out, but actually if you guys at the end, I don't know if we're gonna stay here, but I'll have, um, 
I have actually a lot of these originals and sketches with me if you guys want to take a look and see the process here. Um, and here, th this is actually the, the beat boards or storyboard um, in the publishing world, we call it the dummy, um, which is basically a mock of how the story is going to uh, play out. And um, I, I don't know why they call it dummies. I don't know if anybody in publishing can tell me why, uh, because I f feel like this is where the most, for me anyway, it's where the most thinking is required. You know, how are you going to pace the story? Um, what sort of things are you going to hold back? What are you going to allow the w uh, words to, to say? And where, do I, where does the illustrator need to step in and, um, and sort of uh, illustrate what words are there or not, not there? and what's between the lines. So you can kind of see in the bottom where I've sort of circled, do I illustrate these things or not? And uh, so this is the opening page. Um, and here we just see that he's like many boys or um, just he's just a kind of a typical boy. And um, this is just stuff that I had in my room when I was growing up. So again, kind of channeling that um, personal experience to sort of inform your work. Uh, also, as a side note, the I, a lot of the furniture I'm looking in this, I can't help but to be reminded by Pottery Barn Kids, and I was doing a lot of, I guess I was doing a lot of catalog design for them at the time. So you see a lot of, it's not product placement. I was just I was just drawing it a lot, so it was <laughs> the easiest thing to do. Uh, and here, um, another thing. Um, you don't see it in every illustration, but I wanted as much as possible for this to be told from the child's point of view, because really that's ultimately what the story is. It it's not about, um, it wasn't about making a very um, broad or very grand statement. Um, it's just really about this very important event and how this child's day unfolds as you know he as he um, as the day progresses and how um, how he's just he's got a big job to do. And so here he's kind of running up the chap chapel and, and or running into the, I think they said it was City Hall, um, and they're running through the lobby. I've gotten some, I've seen comments online, like, why, why, does, it, why does the kid get to hold on to the ring? Like, but uh, he's, I, I've argued that it's just, he's a big boy and he can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here's, um, you're kind of going back to what Susan was saying a little bit earlier about allies. Um, that was definitely something that uh, I felt pretty strongly about in, in, in this book as well, is that we, I, I wanted to create a sense of community and really um, to have as many loved ones there and, um, as possible. And I did that by actually showing a lot of people that were in my own wedding. Um, and as you can kind of see Donovan sort of weaving through this crowd. and so there's a sense that he's actually engaged with this crowd and they're sort of stopping him along the way. And that sort of strengthens the idea that these aren't just people casually showing up to a wedding. These are people that are extremely happy to be here and are, and are along the way con congratulating him on, on his big job. And uh, this one was, is probably, a, probably my f favorite uh, piece from the book because it's really showing um, the story from his point of view. Uh, we see, you know, that everybody is uh, sort of above eye level. Um, you kind of have this big moment of, of tension, and um, and the text I think says something like he wasn't supposed to skip, jump, run, uh, backflip down the aisle. It's just, you know, just walk down. And I, uh, this here you, is the moment where you see that he is he's performing his his duties as the ring bearer. Um, and then here again, kind of strengthening the idea of of allies and here you know you have you have the parents there in the front row crying and uh, you have other loved ones behind and you have this moment where both of the moms are crying and there, there's actually this reveal a few pages before where we actually see for the first time oh these are two moms that are that are getting married and um, and it's again to sort of strengthen that the idea that um, that, that this is just any other wedding um, and there, you know, there's no real ex uh, special exceptions that need to be made. It's just two people. It's just another kind of love, and uh, that was definitely some another guiding principle on, um, for me when I was working on these. Um, but here uh, again, sort of putting people that I that I know and and love into the crowd. Uh, we actually have my dad in the front row who um, 
uh, is actually, uh, actually both of the dads are kind of a mix of my dad in different times. There's like young dad with that used to always have a mustache, and then there's older, clean-shaven dad. But both dads, um, for me again, the, a, ch uh, a challenge um, um, for this for this book was um, also um, being able to uh, write something that uh, that would speak to my dad, uh, and it kind of goes back to you know my first book, or the, the book that I saw in Barnes & Noble, and uh, one of the challenges for me working on this is that um, uh, that my dad is actually, he's, he's against the idea of, of, of gay marriage, and you know, he's you know, kind of a staunch con conservative, and, and, I, and I was brought up that way, you know, being an army brat, and, uh, and so this was sort of, you know, in no way to, to compare myself to the hard, the, the sort of challenge uh, any child might face coming out to their parents, but this wasn't a way for me, um, a way to say like, hey dad, this, you know, this is, this is something I believe in, um, and, and I think by, by putting my whole heart into this book and not treating it like just a, a freelance job, um, I think I was able to kind of give that message to my dad, um, and I think he was very proud of me for doing it. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up here. Um, speaking of uh, bodily contact, um, the hardest moment to illustrate in the book was actually the two kisses, or the kiss between the, or you may kiss the bride. Um, in this case, the text is you may kiss the brides. And because the book was so much about Donovan, we wanted to get him in there kind of kissing both moms, and we didn't know how to do that, and it was a very, it was kind of tricky, you know, does he kiss the biological mom first, does he kiss uh, the other mom, does he kiss both somehow at the same time, and you can see on the top right, it just looks a little bit uh, kind of detached, and um, what we ended up going with is this, where it looks like he's just rushed in and kissed um, uh, his non-biological mother, and the other mother looks like she may have been leaning in, and that's why that you have this sort of contact with, uh, all both of their cheeks are kind of are touching, and there's this sort of warm, uh, embrace between all three. And I, I feel this is still a very intimate moment, um, uh, even if we've kind of dodged the, you know, the kissing between two brides, um, because, uh, I mean, as part of my, my daily ritual, my, my two-year-old son and my wife and I, we actually have this family hug, and he's actually just starting to talk, and he says, family hug, like that. And so, and that's a very, it's a very, uh, I mean, it, it gets my day off to a good start, and so I know that there's there's something to be said for this sort of uh, this sort of a moment. And I'm actually all done. Yeah, I'm gonna skip ahead. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay.
everyone. My name is Loretta Torres, and I'm a fifth grade uh, elementary school teacher at uh, in San Francisco Unified, and I'm a Spanish bilingual teacher. So I'm here today to talk about a book that I worked on um, called Antonio's Card. But before we get there, I want to really appreciate and offer my love for your garment as well. It was just so wonderful to see you break down the book and, and talk about it from that perspective. That's a real treat. We forget in the business. We're like reading books and we forget all the work and the thinking. And so I really appreciate that. Um, I thought we'd start it off with a little video. And I've been sitting a long time and I promise I won't. Hopefully we can do this in. Um, so this is a video. What went around is a little packet that is something that San Francisco Unified has this enormous binder. I just brought a small sampling of, of a few ideas. I know some of you are in the teaching, seeking a teaching profession or and or considering it. So it's something to give you an idea of teachable moments, things that come up for us in, especially in my school in an urban setting of predominantly Latino students who are predominantly Christian and heterogeneous or heterosexual, so they're very, um, you know, we don't talk about these things, and so how to kind of bring it in. So let me get this up and running, and I'll be quiet now, and uh, see what I can get up on. Is there a volume? Oh, I think it was on the mute. I unmuted yeah. it. Yeah, no, you, you I muted it. it. Yeah. Can you hear it? No, there's no speakers. Sorry.
Thanks very much. Um, can you hear me without the mic, or should I talk on the mic? Okay, back there without a mic. All right, good. No, it helps us with the camera if you use the mic. Okay, I can follow directions. <laughs> All right, so family and love is really what this is about for me and with our students. Um, this book, Antonio's Card, um, is a bilingual book, and I really had the pleasure of meeting both the author and the illustrator in the classroom. They came and they gave all of our students one copy each because we worked on the uh, lessons. If you go to Children's Press, there's a book, there's the title of the book and the lessons that you can do, and we've actually tried these. Um, the packet that I gave you The packet that I um, passed out gives you the website where you can find the binder. But it also starts with where we like to start with, this, with our students. It's just what does it mean to be gay? A lot of our students in, the, in our schools use, you're gay, that's gay, you're, you know, and they use it as an insult. They use it as a way to hurt someone's feelings or the way to say a swear word. So they replaced it with what I traditionally grew up as swear words, now they use gay. And so it's, it's a very hard one to deal with straight out and just say, well, what is, you know, uh, my question is, what does that mean to you? Why are you using that word? And they generally don't really know. They don't really understand. They've just heard it and people make fun of it at home. And um, so the way to introduce it is through first the discussion and then reading um, literature. And I've brought several books that, you know, I'm happy to pass around that really help you um, explain something without so many words. Um, I didn't want to read the book, but I'm sort of leaning toward reading the book just because it's so beautiful and I like that it's a bilingual book. I like that it's a Latino family or Latino woman with, you know, there's that bilingualism. And so that really goes right to our kids' hearts about, oh, it's a family. So bear with me and I'll try not to kill the book. Honestly, what drew me to this book is that it's about Mother's Day. And that's such a big issue because we are so typical, so many teachers start with a family tree, or they did in the past, or they do in other areas outside of San Francisco, and the traditional family of a mother and a father and the children and the grandparents, you know, and it's just this very traditional tree, and yet it excludes an enormous amount of people, adopted, foster, um, gay families different families and so I was drawn to this book because of that of those issues um, that it's for Mother's Day so <clears throat> Antonio likes how letters make words while he eats his alphabet cereal in the morning he spells out mommy in the bowl of milk and his mother gives him a kiss he writes te quiero I love you on a napkin and draws a heart around the words he puts the napkins in his mother's purse while she looks for the house keys how do you spell keys, he asks, as they walk out the door. K-E-Y-S, Antonio answers. Y en español, she asks, as they walk to the car, Antonio beams. L-L-A-V-E-S, he says, llaves. Goodbye, Antonio, a sleepy voice calls out as Antonio leaves for school. It is Leslie, his mother's partner. She waves to the bedroom window, as she does every morning. Antonio runs up to the window and presses his hand against the glass, his his small hand against his, her bigger hand, all the way to school. She feels the press of the window on his palm. Adios, Antonio, see you later, his mother waves when they get there. Mommy loves you. Keep an eye out for Leslie this afternoon. Afternoon, the school empties out like a spilled bag of marbles. Parents of all shapes and sizes come to greet their children. The tallest person coming down the street is Leslie, looking like a splattered clown uh, splattered canvas in her workshop overalls. Behind Antonio, a few kids giggle, saying, that woman looks like a guy. You start to feel, well, turn to your partner, and what do you think Antonio's feeling? Just turn and talk for a minute so you don't have to listen. Go ahead and turn and talk. What are you thinking Antonio's feeling? What's going he's on already? Yeah. Well, one doesn't think. He's not the only yeah, one. No. So blushing, Antonio runs down 
the sidewalk to meet Leslie. Hey there, big guy, Leslie says. Should we read beneath that tree before mommy comes to pick us up? Maybe, Antonio says. What's the matter, Leslie asks. Is something wrong? No, nothing, says Antonio, looking over his shoulder. Can we just leave, Leslie, please? Absolutely, Leslie says. That sounds like a good word to spell, she adds. I can't spell that word yet, Antonio protests as he pulls Leslie across the street. He makes his fit right away and opens the corner of his book. Essentially, they sit and read by the tree, and they, they're sitting near the school to wait for their mom, the other mom to pick them up. But he's nervous, and he's nervous because what's coming up the next day is Mother's Day. How is he going to explain? He's already heard Leslie being insulted. She looks like a clown. She looks like, you know, just odd. She looks like a guy. Since it's nearly Mother's Day, I'm putting his classmates to make cards for the special women in their lives. The classroom bursts with color from crayon markers from scraps of paper and bottles and bottles of glitter. That tree looks cool, Antonio's best friend, Carlos says over Antonio's shoulder. The other kids nod. Very nice, Antonio, Miss Mendoza says. And who is your card for? For Mommy and Leslie. Yeah, you know, that play on Bailey, the play on Leslie, so he doesn't really have to explain. Miss um, Mendoza puts her hand on Antonio's shoulder, and she says, that's very nice of you. I love this illustration, especially, and I know it's hard to see, but there's a tree with family and familia in it. So I really draw my students into family. So to get them to start thinking, oh, there's two moms, but they're a family? That's kind of weird. In fact, some people go, ew, you know, because they're starting, to, they're starting to think about the sexual connotations in their head or what that means. And then, you know, it's like, oh, why did you say ew? Let's talk about that. You know, so this is really drawing them. But it's talking about family. Do you have a family? Do you have a family? How does your family interact? Do they love each other? So we really start bringing that into the students. Um, Antonio hunches over the piece of paper on his desk, protecting from anybody else's sight. He presses the green crayon into the page. He draws his mother and Leslie sitting next to him as they read a book together. He writes in letters like pretty birds among the leaves. Family. And then the teacher announces, tomorrow, We'll put the cards up in the cafeteria for a Mother's Day display. Ugh, Antonio's hand freezes on his card. The taunting of the kids echoes in his head. Look, there's that rodeo clown. And so as, I'll let you pick up the book or get it somewhere. And so as the story unfolds, he's really wrestling with the shame, the embarrassment of being different of how to explain it to his friends, mean kids are going to be mean and cruel to him. What's he gonna say? How's he gonna display this, this family card in his mind to these children who don't understand? Presenting this very, very, very deep issue to our students through literature is just amazing. And it just really gets to their heart, gets to, to something that's familiar, their family, their love. Um, different families have different ways of of being, and so um, I really, really appreciate you know the authors and the illustrators because for my students, we've tried different activities around literature using Antonio's card, using one dad, two dads, brown dad, um, Molly's family, where we have even Harvey Milk's story, bringing things in, in for the students to see all these different books and literature. It talks about bullying, it talks about um, meanness, it talks about um, diversity, and in the end, it takes you right to the core of the children with something they can understand. Family, love, and how acceptance of others is what the key purpose is. I um, don't really have anything more. I think you can read, do you want me to finish the last, last little bit? I already turned it around. I think I have another couple minutes. All right, okay. I love this book. So he's very sad. He walks to school and he's really worried and very sad. And how many of my students carry these secrets you know, in their pockets as they walk in? And we might think that they're depressed. We might think that they're, they hate school. But really and truly, it's some of these things that we as teachers put on them and write a Mother's Day card. You know, I've moved away a lot from Mother's Day cards. And I'll say it's a family card, you know, and who's taking care of your the children is a grandparent, an uncle, an aunt, so many different families that we have now, we can't 
stereotype it's a mom and dad and and you know the hecklers in the classroom and I've had many hecklers ooh well that's weird you know kid just piped up and said I have an uncle that's gay or I have a niece and I'll say my nephew is and then suddenly it's a real conversation that we're having with some really you have someone and it's just being very open and transparent with the children one way we we inform the parents is we send out curriculum or a letter saying we're going to be introducing conversation around diversity around fa different different families and you know our Latino parents kind of have a knee-jerk reaction and they don't like it but eventually the kids go home and talk about what we've talked about and couching it with the book is just the way so in the end the m the mom Leslie is a painter and she's made a portrait of um, of, her, of the mom, of the biological mom, and that just gets to Antonio's heart, and so he decides the next day that rather than feeling shame, and there's all these words in the cover, there's amor, absolute family, absolutely, familia, that he is going to be brave and go and present the Mother's Day card to both of his mothers at the cafeteria in school courageous move for a little boy but you know he does it and he feels great they love it and that's all the time I have I had to be the difficult one and bring my own computer. My name is Amy Kilgard, and I'm a professor in the Communication Studies Department. I teach classes particularly in performance studies. I remember when I was 12 years old, sitting in the family room, wearing my pajamas, which at the time was a costume that my mother had made for me out of a sheet when I was obsessed with the goddess Iris in fifth grade. And I was sad because my first big production that I had been in, the Valdosta State College, which is now Valdosta State University's production of The Music Man, had ended, and I was crying because I missed it so much. My parents comforted me, telling me that there would be more performances, and there were. But I think I was mourning that day more than the chance to be on stage. I was mourning the community of performers and techies and musicians that had become my temporary family in that production. I knew that that family would never be together in that way again, and we weren't. At 12, I learned something important about ensembles, that when they are great, their ephemerality and their bounded temporality are part of what make them great and part of what make them so hard to say goodbye to. I've spent the last 25 years making and ending ensembles always with the hope of using those communities to do some kind of important social work, and always with the hope of learning how to live in these generative and temporary moments of hope. So at SFSU, I was excited to be able to teach COM 696, the Ensemble Performance Workshop class. Each time I've taught this class, I have been fortunate to have ambitious, generous, exciting students sign up in spring of 2011, the stars collided and brought an especially amazing group of people together to work on uh, this project, Dragons and Dresses and Ducklings, oh my. 
Uh, Susan and I had worked for several semesters to prepare COM 696 that semester to create a performance adapted from some of the books we've been talking about today, specifically book children's picture books that investigated gay and lesbian GLBTQ uh, characters and themes. Students partially signed up, I think, because of the topic and enthusiastically embraced the chance to work together to create this performance. We had the perfect storm of graduate and undergraduate students who had an astonishing array of personal connections to the topic. Um, some folks had worked on campaigns in response to teen bullying around sexuality. Some had been bullied themselves. Uh, some were parents of small children. Uh, some were interested in youth counseling. Some were gay, lesbian, and queer folks. Some were allies. This allowed us to create a powerful ensemble that could effectively embark in advocacy. We hope to practice advocacy at four levels with this project, with uh, students in the class, with the university community, with the local Bay Area community, and with the larger community of scholars and artists. And to do, so, to do this, we made some choices about venues, aesthetics, and strategic alliances. Uh, we used the books themselves, both the text and the illustrations, uh, as springboards for making aesthetic choices that complicated heteronormative representations of children and families. And so I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about those choices that we made uh, specifically. Uh, first, a couple of things about logistics. We did this project with a couple of different coalitions. One coalition we made was with the San Francisco Public Library, and that's one of the things I, I, I was resonating as, as uh, you were talking earlier about the coalitions that we need to do artistic projects of this kind. Um, we had made this coalition with the San Francisco Public Library in hopes of uh, influencing not just our students, but the uh, broader San Francisco and Bay Area communities and opening it up to uh, audiences. So that meant that we performed this show, not just here on campus, as, which is our typical practice for the ensemble performance workshop, but also at the downtown branch of the San Francisco Public Library, where they have a great auditorium that, if you don't know, is available for uh, community use if you have uh, an appropriate and exciting opportunity. Uh, any community member can actually make use of that auditorium for free, uh, and we were able to do that uh, if you offer the program for free to the public. Um, this also allowed for us to have an audience uh, with folks who may not have come out to San Francisco State of children and adults. Uh, we also made a coalition with our colleagues in the journalism department. Uh, one photojournalism class uh, did a fabulous project where they took family photos of our class members, families, um, inspired by Gigi Kaiser's and Peggy Gillespie's photographic exhibit and book, Love Makes a Family. And this reminds me of the, about what Loretta was showing, that, that documentary, um, that's, that's what makes a fam family. Um, this is a similar project, taking pictures of a, a diverse uh, variety of families. And so our photojournalism program, oh, this is our company, uh, our photojournalism co uh, class took these amazing photographs of our students' uh, families, the way uh, our students define them. And you can see a whole range of different kinds of families that were represented there. I also wanted to note that one of the practices in this class is that uh, it's kind of a bottom-up approach in terms of adaptation of literature. And so the students themselves worked on adaptations of uh, these books first and then a number of their original ideas came into the final productions. Um, for example, uh, well, I'll, co I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so, as people who work with the performance medium, we have access to people's bodies, often in real time and space, shared with audience members. Um, and as such, we have a responsibility to think about and make conscious choices about who performs in what kinds of parts what kinds of actions are represented on stage, and who will and will not feel called uh, or implicated by our performances. And to, count, to account for these issues, uh, I'm, I'm talking about some of the aesthetic choices we made. One of the aesthetic choices specifically was the representation of couples and parents in the performance. So the books we had chosen, I should mention, uh, a number of them we've uh, noted today, were The Different Dragon, 
written by Jennifer Bryan and illustrated by Donna Marie Hosler, 10,000 Dresses, which uh, Marcus uh, told us about, The Sissy Duckling, written by Harvey Firestein and uh, illustrated by Henry Cole, Jesse's Dream Skirt, written by Bruce Mack and illustrated by Marion Buchanan, In Our Mother's House, that Susan talked about a little while ago, written and illustrated by Pat Patricia Polacco, and Tango Makes Three, uh, as several folks have, have discussed, the Duke Who Outlawed Jelly Beans and Other Stories, written by Johnny Valentine and illustrated by Lynette, Lynette Schmidt, and El Amor de Todos los Coleros, The Many Colored Love, written by Lucia Moreno Velo, illustrated by Javier Termenin. And I have a few of these beautiful bookmarks that, uh, that were from the performance that have the books on the back, so if you're really interested, please uh, have one. Um, so one of the things we thought about was the representation of couples and parents. And uh, it was apparent in the books that we chose to represent that there were more mothers than fathers represented. And we wanted to make sure that we were uh, representing a more of a range of, of parents. And so this was the illustration of the book And Tango Makes Three. And even though there aren't human parents involved in that story, we chose to have two fathers represented uh, telling that story um, in, the, in the performance. You can see uh, this connects to some of the and Tango Makes Three. We also had the different dragon, which has two mothers represented, and we had two mothers uh, in the beginning of that representation. Uh, and then the, one of the mothers actually tells that story to her son, and so we see them there. Um, we also had, uh, this is the sissy duckling. In that case, there are no humans in that book either. We chose to have a single parent, a mother, telling the story to her son there. Uh, we also wanted to attend to a, uh, a diversity of uh, intersections of identity in casting, and that's a luxury because I had a diverse cast, a physically uh, appearing diverse cast, which is not something that one always has, but we had a cast that was diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, social class, gender performance, and sexuality, and all of those things informed and were able to uh, be present in our, in our performances. Thus, we wanted to offer a complex but understandable representation of gender in both human and non-human characters. So for example, The Sissy Duckling is a book about ducks. In performances, we didn't use ducks. We had people performing those characters. Um, but we had perf uh, performers play both their, uh, the gender they identify with and characters that, that were not the gender they identified with. Um, and in this case, uh, you can see that there's a little bit of ambiguity about gender uh, in this performance uh, of the sissy duckling. The, the performer wearing the yellow is the, is the character of the sissy duckling. And the one uh, with the baseball bat is an adult duck. In the performance, we had all the ducklings, the young ducks wearing yellow and all the adult ducks wearing brown to create this sense. Um, I like this photo because you can see three levels of kind of story here happening. Um, the story of the, of the book itself is kind of playing out on your wait, right. Um, the story being told is kind of in the middle and our narrator was on the far side of, the, of that uh, slide. Something like that. Um, playing baseball. Um, we also had, uh, in, in the book 10,000 Dresses, we had a cisgendered male performer playing uh, Bailey, and I loved his performance of Bailey uh, because he was really open to performing a gender, a more fluid gender identity as the performer. And so audience members had the opportunity to see this male performer performing a more uh, fluid gender performance uh, which I think is something that, that, that Marcus talked about in terms of, of the illustrations and the writing of that book, having a, a kind of more fluid gender identity performance present um, and complicating a, a kind of understanding. And we use the pronouns as they are in the book. Um, 
always referring to Bailey as she, uh, except for the parent who, uh, and, the, and the siblings who uh, say, no, you're a boy. And one of my favorite moments in performance of this is when uh, a young child in the audience gets up and yells, no, you can wear whatever you want. Uh, and, and so the way that children responded to this was really, really beautiful. Um, so the 10,000 dresses is, a, is a, as Marcus pointed out, is a, is a kind of not realistic portrayal. Um, one of the great things we can do in performance is play with those notions, but we can't, um, we, we still have to deal with our real bodies. And so I love these moments of the dresses in performance. Um, they came in a variety of formats. Um, unfortunately, not quite as luminous as the illustrations, um, but I, I think the dancing was one of the ways we marked the magical kind of uh, experiences in the performance. I also like in, in this case, we have a, a cisgender female performer performing the older, bigger brother, and she's actually smaller than <laughs> Bailey, but her, her butt, oh, <laughs> tough. Um, we, we also had the penguins. Here we have, uh, have two characters portraying the penguins. Um, you know, this is really, really uh, stuff that should be banned. They're singing together and, and teaching, uh, teaching their baby to be an appropriate penguin. Um, I also wanted to point to some of the places where our students came up with these fabulous ideas. So one of the things in the 10,000 Dresses story that the students came up with was a great uh, dance, company dance that they did as a way of bringing in the magic of the dresses. All of the company members are wearing versions of dresses. Um, we also had a, a fabulous slumber party for the Duke who outlawed jelly beans. Um, I loved the idea of having a slumber party that didn't really matter the gender performance of the, of the participants in the slumber party. They were gonna tell the story and have a, have a good time doing it. Um, so silly. Um, this also leads me to talk about a couple of the structures of the show. Um, one of the things that we did was incorporate uh, windows, these windows as a way of seeing into different families' lives. And our narrator here in the center is trying to figure out, well, what, it, what is it that, that is making the family? Um, and eventually comes to the understanding that she can see into all of these different fam families and that love is in fact what, uh, what makes that family work. And that love is a many colored love. So I wanted to show uh, the performers who did the windows were dancers and they uh, created these little interstitial moments in between the stories themselves. Um, you can also see the kind of rainbow uh, theme that connects to the topic of our panel. And we ended with, uh, we ended and began with the different dragon, which is a story about uh, a dragon who's different. And the dragons are supposed to be mean and scary, but this dragon liked to play badminton and eat ice cream and didn't want to scare people. And the little boy tells the dragon that it's okay. Um, we, it's okay to be different. We should all uh, celebrate that kind of difference. Um, we also use these rainbow ribbons uh, as the many colored love that, that moves between and among all of these different stories and all of these different families. Going forward, what these books and this production teach me is that we must be attentive to our aesthetic choices in all of our representational forms. These books pave the way for greater inclusivity in all our art, whatever the medium. <laughs>